Good evening, everyone. Our first song this evening is going to be number or number 708, Walking in Sunlight. We'll sing all three verses. Walking in sunlight all Shall we pray? 
Father in heaven, thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your patience. Thank you for your love. We're grateful, Father, that we can call you, Father, that we have the assurances that you give us through your word, and we have the knowledge that you made possible for us to have on how to live the life that you would have us live. Father, we pray for wisdom. We pray for strength. We pray for zeal on just being able to do that, to live as you would have us live. It's grateful, Father, that you have given us this family of people that meets at this place. We're so grateful, Father, that you've taught us about love and what it means and how important it is to our existence, our happiness. We thank you, Father, that you have shown us what it means by giving the very best that you have for our benefit. Not because we deserve it, not because we've earned it, but because you loved us so that you gave your only begotten son. And we thank you for that. As we go further tonight, Father, we pray that you'll bless the speaker of the hour. We pray that you'll bless Drew in his leading of the songs. And we pray, Father, that as part of the congregation, part of the body that meets at this place, that we will all join in and worship to, the, to you in a way that is pleasing. This we pray in Christ's name. Amen. For the scripture reading and lesson, we'll sing first and last verse of the Glory Land Way. And if it's convenient for you, let's stand for this song. Good evening, church. Uh, three or four of you out there. Good. First of all, I need to apologize. Come to find out after preaching this morning that some of you way back in the back couldn't hear me because I got away from the microphone. I meant to bring me a piece of rope tonight so I could tie myself to the podium so I wouldn't stray too far. Uh, but they gave me another mic instead so I can run all over the place and still preach, you see. But usually when people can't hear me at home way back there, I just move back that way. It works for me, you know. And so, But thank you for your presence and thank you for the invitation and allowing us to be here. Two other things I failed to mention this morning uh, after Brother Guy introduced the fact that I preached that 
Le Mossabac. Uh, I was going to say something about that name. Uh, how many of you went to the Bible in the Old Testament to look for it? It sounds like an Old Testament name, but you won't find it in the Bible. It's actually made up of the names of the five, I believe it is, founding families of the congregation. And I know one of them was Lemuel, Lemuel get my tongue untangled to begin with, and the other one was McCorkle. I can't remember. One of them has to do with a girl named Sally, I think, really. But that congregation was established in 1843. 1843. So we're right out 176 years old. I remember not long after coming to the Lamassa Mac, uh, we had the 106th, 165th homecoming. 165th. Someone says, well, 165. I said, we could. Yes, we could do that, you know. My, not many congregations have that kind of a record, you see, or, or have lasted that long. Congregations come and go. Uh, a lot of things change. I have spent the last, well, let me back up. I, I spent the first nearly 20 years of, of my ministry in full-time work, in, in the sense of being a full-time gospel preacher. Um, with all the uh, goods and bads, highs and lows of, 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 of the work. I spent my last 25 years building a business, but also still preaching on a regular basis. In fact, uh, I preached probably more as a part-time preacher than I did as a full-time minister. Uh, probably about 48 Sundays out of the year, and I still do that. But I did that work in a job that uh, between March and April, we averaged about 70 hours a week working because it's irrigation, it's to do with farming, and, and you, you have to roll with it, you know. And, and so most of my sermonizing, in the first 20 years, it was sitting in the office, books in front of me, you know, being in, having the time to study. Full-time minister, most of the time, he spends his time in study, or he spends his time with the brethren, solving problems, solving issues, taking care of problems that may come up, or whatever the case may be. Very seldom do you get to spend a lot of time evangelizing. And that's just the truth of the matter. I've had more opportunity to teach people about Jesus Christ in part-time ministry than I ever had in full-time ministry. It allows me to see things from a totally different perspective. One, it allows me to put myself in your place in the sense of what it's like to work a 40 or 50 hour or 60 hour week uh, and, and be uh, a, a part of the uh, teaching or, or song leading or whatever part of worship or, or just being here to participate in worship. And, and, and I understand that, you know. And I know the, the, the ins and outs of that. And so... Uh, we spend a lot of time now, uh, over the last 25 years, working with small congregations. Um, and some of them I've started with, that was, they was probably as small as 10, 12, 14, 15 people. Always with the desire, let's build you up, find uh, a place that you're comfortable as far as membership, and let's go find someone that could come in and, and, and preach maybe full time for you. I've had success in doing that. I've done that with a few congregations. But with a few other congregations, there was just no growth. A, a lot of it had to do with the fact that uh, 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 of, of demographics. Uh, I spoke about the Cat Corner Church. Uh, we hold with uh, outside of Bogota there, between Bogota and, and Glendale. Some of you may know that. That was a congregation that back in the 60s had 200 members. Just a rural congregation, shotgun building, half the size of this one, 200 people. But when you walked out in the 60s from that church building and looked out around you, you probably seen 75 or 80 houses, families that lived on the farms uh, with your tenant farmers, your sharecroppers. Well, what changed? Well, the demographics, you see. It's not that these people quit evangelizing. It's just that everybody moved off, you see. And so they held on for, for a good many years after that, probably in, in the 90s and, and up to about... 2000, and finally uh, they got down to just a few members. Well, uh, during this time of working with smaller congregations, and added that to the full-time work where I worked with 
a much larger, larger congregation. Uh, it gives me a lot of perspective about church, about church growth, about uh, what works, what doesn't work, you see, in, in a sense. And so when I come before an audience like you and I, I don't know you, really, right? Uh, most all of you don't know me. I can count the number of people in here. I, I know probably on, on one hand. And so I don't know a whole lot about your work. I don't know a whole lot about your growth. I, I do know that you have grown because you got more numbers on the board than the last time I was here uh, at a gospel meeting. Uh, so I do know that's, that's taking place, and so that's a very positive sign. Uh, I don't know a whole lot about programs or anything. But when I stand before a group of people, it's very easy, as I was telling one of the elders this morning uh, at lunch, it, it's very easy just to open the file cabinet and pull out one of those real good sermons that you preach 14 times and, and, and come up here and march before you stand and, and, and give delivery of that. Uh, and it would be a good sermon, no doubt, uh, because I preached it before, maybe more than once. But in the last 10 years, I closed my filing cabinets, and I've never drawn a sermon out since then. <coughs> Uh, to the point that due to my work, I don't have time to sit down 10 or 15 hours a, a week to, to, to prepare lessons. So how do I do that? I do it driving down the highway. That's why I do my sermonizing, driving down the highway. I think of things, and I dwell on, on what I see in the church and what I understand about the church, and I dwell on lessons of how can I help. And, and that's all we strive to do in, in presenting the lessons. We still call them gospel sermons, but I, I want to have an effect. I gave up a long time ago thinking I was going to be in an Apollos. Uh, so I decided I, I wanted to be a Barnabas. <laughs> and a Barnabas is a, is a person who encourages, you see. And, and so uh, that's all I want to do is, is to encourage you. And, and the lessons that we bring this morning, again, it's not a reflection on anything that I know about you. It's a reflection on things that I have seen, the things that I have worked through and worked with in, in 45 years of preaching, and, and things that I think uh, sometimes are things that we, we can improve on, things that can help us. But bottom line is to help us to understand who we are as a people of God and be focused on the work that God has, has given to us. And so we introduced that this morning. morning. What, in, what in the world? Oh, stop. <laughs> the second thing I forgot to mention is that my lovely bride of 44 years <laughs> uh, was unable to be here this morning. Don't be sad. She's been on, on a cruise from New York City to Nova Scotia. I wasn't invited. But she's coming home. She called me from Nashville a while ago. She would have loved to have been here. She's been here with me in, in gospel meetings. And, and some of you know her more than you know me because she was born and raised in Glendale, Tennessee, uh, outside of Newburn over there. So, uh, but, so let's get back. So, so what in the world are we doing? As God's people, as the church, uh, uh, what is it that we're doing? What should we be doing? Are we accomplishing that? Uh, in the Lord's church today. Understanding that God called us out of the world. And we're going back to John chapter 17, the first couple of, well, verses 6 through about verse 8 there, where Jesus said that you gave me these disciples out of the world. You brought them out of the world. You gave them to me. I transformed them. I, 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 I converted them. And, and maybe that's not the best way. Conversion is a one and done thing. Transformation is a process. We're converted to Christ through the gospel, okay? Uh, through our obedience to the gospel. That begins the transformation. But if you're still living and breathing, you're still in that transformation process, you see. We, we, we're always trying to change and to grow into being uh, what God wants us to be. Always trying to grow up unto the head of all things who, who is Christ, you see. And so uh, Jesus changed us. He, he, he put us in, into a rightful relationship with God. He reconciled that, that thing we lost back in the Garden of Eden. And now we're reconciled to God and we're in Christ and, and we're God's people. And then Jesus sends us right back into that world that God took us out of. Again, it's not a physical thing. It's, it's, it's a spiritual thing. 
the transformation, the conversion, the bringing out, the sending back. It's all about our spiritual lives. It's about what Paul would describe as, uh, as he talks about uh, uh, our spiritual circumcision. Uh, that was a spiritual operation that, that God has accomplished. And it's a spiritual thing that we're talking about when we talk about God bringing us out of the world, changing us, and then sending us back into the world. Uh, and, and, and that's what uh, God created us to do. Ephesians chapter 2, begin about verse 8, For by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourselves is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And he says down in verse 10, Because God... Uh, we are, we are God's craftsmanship. Uh, we are God's workmanship. God created us. Well, why? He created us to do the works that he has prepared for us that was in his mind even before he nailed the first nail into this whole world to create it, you see. And so we, we, we're to be about doing the works of God. But, but we talked about what it is, but this evening I want to talk about where that is. Where is it that we are to do what we ought to be doing uh, in our service to God? And, and that's the thing I want us to focus on uh, this evening. We notice uh, as we close that, I think perhaps this morning the Great Commission, go into all the world, go teach all nations, baptizing them in the name, or go teach, uh, go make disciples of all nations, literally, uh, 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 Baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have taught you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Go into all the world. The world's a big place. And that seems like a very large task. It seemed uh, perhaps even a, a much larger task for them back there than it would be for us in here, you see, at this time. But that was the command. Uh, and what I want us to understand is that the task that God gave us as the church and the way he identifies us as his people is a task that's not done in here, but it's actually done out there. Uh, the work that God created us to do, uh, is a, it's an outside job. You know, guys at home, we have, that, that, that there's... Uh, Inside work to be done. Uh, that's housework, ladies, to be done. And then that's yard work to be done. And, and we know how that usually divides up. But, but what I'm trying to say to you is that the job that God has given to us is an outside job, okay? It's, 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 it's work that we need to do out there where? In the world that he has sent us back into, you see. Uh, uh, what we are to do is, is not, don't misunderstand this. It's not done in the church, in that sense. It's not done to the church, and it's not done for the church. You follow me? It is something that the church does. It's something that we do, and it's what we do out there. Uh, and so that's to be our focus. Take the gospel out there, not take it in here. It, 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 it is not uh, 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 about going to church <laughs> in as much as it is about the church going, going and taking the gospel to uh, the world. Uh, so the Great Commission was what? Simply go. I love Matthew's account, and literally if you look at the, the language, it says, as you go. As you go. It's not jumping in your vehicle and driving somewhere. It's not uh, getting on a train or a bus. I've, I've been privileged, I've been blessed, I've been able to preach the gospel in, in Europe, in, in Africa, in, in South America, in the Caribbean, if you can call that preaching in there sometimes. Uh, uh, but, you know, but it's not about jumping in some kind of travel vehicle and going somewhere. That's not what the Great Commission is about. The Great Commission is that when we leave this church building, when we leave our houses 
And we go out into the world when we, when we go to the job, when we go to school, when we go down to the retirement center, or we go, whatever the case may be, that as we, as we are doing those everyday things in our lives in the world where Christ has sent us, do the work that God wants us to do. And that is to teach and to make disciples, you see. Lead people to Christ. That, that is to be our focus, you see. Uh, uh, Jesus told the disciples, you know, you wait here in Jerusalem. Uh, we, Acts chapter 1, about verse 8. Wait here in Jerusalem to receive power from on high. And when the Holy Spirit comes, He says, then I want you to take the gospel and I want you to go. I want you to go to G Judea, to Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the world. That was the commandment. Go, Jesus says. It's where I wanted you to go. But understand, the going into the world of, of, of the Great Commission is, again, it's not, a, it's not a physical realm in that sense. Although we may identify it by physical places, uh, in our thinking of it, the same world that Jesus wants to go teach all nations is the same world that God brought us out of, you see. It is that same uh, world that is controlled as Paul... John will write in 1 John 2, 19, that the whole world, he says, comes under the influence and the control of the evil one, and that's Satan, of course. And so it's the same world, you see, that God brought us out of to save us and send us back in to preach. And so it's not about uh, putting an X on the map, so to speak, you know, and, 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 and thinking of it in a geographical way. It's going back out in this world, this sphere, that, that operates under the control, under the, under the power of Satan. And that's where we're to take the gospel, into that world, you see. Uh, the disciples uh, even had trouble doing it physically in that sense, right? Jesus said, start here in Jerusalem, go to Judea, to Samaria, keep on going. Acts chapter 2, gospel is preached, church begins, they begin... Uh, with 3,000 people, counting just the, the men on that day. Uh, turn to another page, chapter 4, the church is growing and multiplying. Turn to chapter 5, the church is growing and multiplying. Where are they? They're in Jerusalem. Chapter 6, the church is growing and multiplying. Where are they? They're in Jerusalem. Chapter 7, where are they? They're in Jerusalem. We're looking at about eight years <laughs> past the giving of uh, the beginning of the church in Acts chapter 2. And, and the disciples are still in Jerusalem preaching the gospel. They haven't even got beyond the, the walls of the city yet, you see. Now, granted, Jerusalem was a big place. If I understand right, reading something somewhere a long time ago, uh, you know, the synagogue was in established at that time. It had been established for several hundred years. And synagogues was kind of like religious community centers, you know, for the Jewish people. There were 70, 70 in the city of Jerusalem. So it was a big place, you see. But they never got out of the neighborhood, so to speak. And, and you know what God does? He did the same thing that he did to the descendants of Noah back there in Genesis chapter 9 through about chapter 11. Remember the descendants of Noah? God told them when they got off the ship, you know, and he says, I want you to be fruitful. I want you to multiply, just like he told Adam and Eve, and I want you to replenish the earth. And the people looked around and said, mm, I don't think we want to do that. Let's just stay together. Let's just be a tight-knit group and family. Let's don't get scattered out here. And so they built this tower. And they built that tower, and it could probably have been uh, uh, available with a flame up there, but they, they, they built it high enough so if people got too far away, or they got far enough away that they might have gotten lost, they could look for that tower and they, they could come back home. But what they were doing was the exact opposite of what God told them to do. And so what does God do? He said, no, I'm not getting away with that. So he goes in, he confuses the language and he scatters the people so that what he commanded them to do would be fulfilled. What did he tell the disciples? Well, you start in Jerusalem. But from there, you need to spread it out. And you need to go into Judea around Jerusalem. And you need to go into Samaria. That's likely the best place to, to, to start because, you know, uh, at least we're now getting towards 
uh, somebody who not are completely Jews. We're getting to the Samaritans. And then, you know, the uttermost parts of the world, that's, that's to the Gentiles. Seven chapters later and eight years later, nothing's happened. So what does happen? Persecution. Starts with Stephen. Him being persecuted for preaching one of the greatest lessons concerning the Old Testament you'll find in the Bible. And who was there at, at Saul's stone? Uh, Saul's, Stephen. Mm-hmm. Stephen's cruci- uh, uh, stoning. I'll get it out in a second. Saul of Tarsus. And so when we jump into ta- chapter 8 of, of, of the book of Acts, what do we read? And Saul of Tarsus was making havoc. One translation says, was ravaging. You know, I don't even have to go to a Greek lexicon to understand the meaning of those two words. What he was doing was terrible. What he was doing was, was awful in persecuting the church, you see. And, but what happened when the church was persecuted? It says that the Christians were driven out of Jerusalem. And they went everywhere. Doing what? Making disciples. Preaching the gospel. And so uh, God did the same thing with the church in Jerusalem that he did with the descendants of Noah back there. He got their attention and he, he got them to the point where they're doing what they're doing. So they went everywhere. Who went everywhere? The Christians went everywhere. Wasn't the apostles because they stayed back in Jerusalem. It was the Christians, the church members, the disciples. Every day, they they had been those that had been taught went to teach. It made no difference if they was talking to one individual or talking to a village of people. What God was doing was not about the church. It was about it was being done by the church. You see. The focus of the church was making disciples. And you make disciples by teaching the Word of God. It was no more about the church in the New Testament as it was about Noah during the flood or about Abraham when he was called, or about Moses when God called him to lead the people out of, out of Egypt, you see. It was always, and still it is always about what God is doing through His people in order to accomplish His purpose, His intent of taking the gospel to the whole world and making sure that as many people as possible can be saved. But I want us to notice, again, it's an outside job. The focus of the church is not the church. It is not about us. Uh, It's not about who we are or, or what we have. Understand, who we are and what we have is great. Remember I talked about God delivering the children of Israel? And when God delivers His people, He, 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 he brings judgment. But, but a second lesson back there from Exodus is that when God delivers His people, He also brings great blessings. When the children of Israel was leaving Egypt, what did they carry with them? Bags of the Egyptians' Gold and silver and jewelry and all kinds of stuff, you see. When God delivers His people, He does so with blessings. It's not about us, it's about God. But understand, it still brings great blessings to us. Sermon of the Mount. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness and and all these things. What things? Things we worry ourselves to death about every day. What we're going to eat, how we're going to clothe ourselves, you know. The material things. Jesus said, don't worry about those things. I'll give you those things. Jesus says, give. I'll give it back. He said, when I give it back, I'm going to fill the bushel basket full. I'm going to shake it up till it's running over full. Because no matter how much you give, I will always give back more. Can I give God? We're blessed. But that's just the physical stuff. Paul writes in Ephesians chapter 1, uh, verse 3 and verse 7, that in Christ we have all spiritual blessings, forgiveness, reconciliation in Christ. And so, while it's not about us, it's about God accomplishing His purpose through us, 
It's not like, you know, we're not getting anything out of it. We are tremendously blessed in our lives on a day-to-day basis. But our greatness is not what we are to focus on. The moment we focus on our greatness, like the children of Israel did, uh, we lose it in that sense. We have greatness only because of what God did uh, for us in, in Jesus Christ, as our brother led us in prayer a moment ago. We are sinners who are saved by the blood of Jesus Christ in order that we might be the servants of God. It was never about the children of Israel. And they never learned that lesson. They never learned that lesson. And it's not about us. And I hope that we'll learn that lesson, you see. Our focus is not to be in here. Our focus is to be out there when it comes to doing the work of God. Uh, I realized from my own work in the church of the Lord for, for many years uh, that we can, that we have a tendency, and I'm trying to say this with, with, with uh, the sense of, again, I don't know you, I don't know your programs, I don't know what you do, but this is what I've seen in, in, in 45 years. What I've seen is that we spend about 90% of our time, 90% of our effort, 90% of our money, if you count the cost of buildings and all the furnishings and all that kind of stuff, on us. On us. On the church, you see. Uh, uh, and if you want to crush me, that go look at your budget and go down that and see if that figures out. It may not. If it is, you, 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 you can correct me. Uh, uh, gospel meetings. I love gospel meetings. I can even remember when a gospel meeting lasted two to three weeks. And we had two or three gospel meetings a year. Today, again, I don't know how many of y'all have, but we're down in most places to one or two gospel meetings. And some of them don't even last a week today, maybe three or four days. I have no problem with gospel meetings, uh, whether we do them or, or whether or not, as long as we understand what the purpose of God is. But what are we doing in a gospel meeting? We're still spending 90% of the time and 90% of the effort preaching to church members. Because very seldom do we have members who are not members of the church or visitors who are not members of the church. Why is that? Well, one, one reason is probably maybe we didn't invite them. Or maybe they hate us so much they don't want to come. But we send letters out. Again, I don't know how you do it. In my meeting places and times, in times past, when we send a letter out to congregation, we send it to every church in the community, not to, to the Lord's bodies or to the Lord's church. We send it to everyone. <laughs> and to me, I mean, if you're not going to go out there and get them, at least invite them in, you know. I went down to a meeting in, in Mobile, Alabama. I was down visiting family. And as I was a preacher there from northwest Alabama, yes, up around the Florence area, uh, who was holding the meeting, and I went down there to hear him one night. Uh, I had been with him on campaigns down in, 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 in the Caribbean, and uh, uh, a great preacher. And, and after the meeting, uh, I came up, and there was two local denominational preachers there. And, and I introduced myself to them, and I talked to them, and I watched them. And they was going around, and, and they was giving up every piece of literature they could find. And they was giving up whatever books was laid out. I think there were some books uh, out there as well. And they was getting it all. And they said, we don't have anything in our church like this. They were ate up with it. They... they the preaching, what was preached, it, it just overwhelmed them. We need to invite. And we need to invite everyone, you see. Uh, and we need to make that a practice in, in our programs, in, in our work, and the other things that we're doing. Uh, I told you I was not really preaching from a sermon this evening. I'm preaching from notes that I made in my head as I was driving down the road and got home and I wrote them down. Uh, so I, I understand 
uh, where I'm trying to come from here. Listen, we don't belong here. Right? We don't belong here. In fact, Jesus said uh, through Paul, uh, uh, chapter 2, verse 20, I think, in Colossians there, uh, our citizenship is, is not in this world, right? Our citizenship is where? It's in heaven. <laughs> we even sing it, don't we? Don't get me to song. I love song leading. I can't do it hardly anymore. My, my, my voice doesn't allow it. There are notes there that if I try to sing them, I sound like Mr. Whipple from, uh, what was that, Green Acres Show? Uh, boy, that choo just fell off its track for whatever reason right there. But, but anyway, uh, we don't belong here. This world is not my home. <laughs> That's what I was thinking. Of. Well, I'm just passing through. We are strangers here. We are foreigners here. We are pilgrims just passing through. This world is not our home. We are not from this world. We are from God. We had a change of state. We had a change of being. What was is no more, and what now is never was. Did you follow me? What was is no more, and what now is never was. That's the change that took place in my life and your life when we became a new creation in Jesus Christ. What happened to the old creation, the old man? Killed. Dead. Buried. Who are we? We're, we're the new one who never was. Our existence now never existed before. And the existence that we had before we came into Christ doesn't exist anymore. What was is no more. And what is never was. That's the, that's the state of being. That's the change that took place. The whole world remains in the power and the control of the evil one, John says. And we're in it. But thankfully only momentarily. Momentarily. We're not of it. We're living under the control, uh, uh, not of the evil one, of Satan. We're living under the control of God. Two quick things here. Most people in the world, most people in the world are also of the world, okay? Meaning they're not of God. They're not of Christ. They're of Satan. Most people in the world are of the world. They are still... Uh, in the world in that sense. Uh, they still live under Satan's control. Uh, the first problem with that is that they don't know it. Uh, uh, and, 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 and most would strongly object to it if you told them about it. They don't know it. Uh, why is that the case? Why is it that most people are living away from God? And Paul's short commentary on that uh, you can read the whole thing in Romans chapter 1, but the short commentary is in verse 25 when he says, the problem is, is that they exchange the truth uh, about God for a lie. And so that's why they are, are there living under the, 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 the control of Satan, Paul says. But the second problem with this is that most of the people living uh, under the control of Satan uh, is, is, is that, they, that, that they're lost, but the second problem of that issue is, I don't know if we believe that or not. Do we really believe that most of the people in the world, and that would include most of the people around us on a daily basis, are lost, you see? It's not our fault. It's not our fault. It's not God's fault, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie. But nevertheless, they're lost. And, and it sounds, sometimes it seems like we almost are content with allowing that, you know. Well, yeah, they're lost, but, but we're saved. And as long as we can stay separated from them, as long as they stay over there and, and we'll stay over here, then, then there's really no problem, really no issue. Is that how we identify ourselves as God's people? Is, 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 is that how we love people uh, in, 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 in relationship to God? 
but here's the problem. Did we forget where we came from? Did we forget where we came from? Every one of us came from where? Out of the world. We did it, why? Because somebody, somebody who knew we were lost threw us a lifeline. Somebody, it may have been a parent or parents, it, it may have been a, a Bible class teacher, it may have been a preacher, it may have been your neighbor living next door to you, but somebody recognized the state that we were in, lost under the control and power of Satan, and they threw us a lifeline through the gospel of Jesus Christ, and we grabbed hope. And we pulled ourselves unto salvation by obedience to the gospel, you see. We were lost, but, but, but now we're found. But understand that the purpose of those of us who have been found are to find the others who are still lost. That's God's task for us. That's God's purpose and intent for our lives as his people Today. That's how he identifies us. And where are all those lost? Not in here. I, I, I recognize, I realize there may be someone who's lost in here. But when we talk about the mass of people, where do we find them? How do we get to them? How do we get the message to them? How do we, how do we get the gospel? How do we make disciples? And Jesus simply said, as you go every day in your life, make disciples. As you go to work, to school, to play, whatever the case may be, so live your life as becomes the gospel. Remember this morning? So live your life that you show appreciation for the cross of Jesus Christ. So live your life that you will live your life in a way that says, I want to bear fruit and, and be well pleasing to the Lord. And that's how we... Teaching is not necessarily what I'm doing right now in that sense. I mean, it's always what I'm doing right now. I hope I'm teaching right now. Just by the way we live our lives in demonstration of what a true Christian is, in demonstration of the difference that the love of God has made in my life, you see. We have been found in order to go out and find those who are lost. Have we forgotten? Have we forgotten? That Lord's Supper that we partook of this morning, that some may will partake of it this night, that is a memorial feast. That is a monument that God has established just so we won't forget. My wife and, and the girls in New York City, I, I believe they were talking about going by the 9-11 monument. Why was that monument established? So we'll never forget. Why was this established? So we'll never forget what? The cleansing blood of Jesus Christ that not only saved us, but delivered us with great blessings, changed our lives forever because we was lost and now I'm found. But God says, okay, go find the others who are still lost. That's what God wants us to do in this world. As you go out there, into the world, the Satan controls, and where the lost exists, do your very best to teach everyone by the way that you live, with every word that you say, the truth about God, about who He is, the difference that He's made in your life, and the difference that He can make in others' lives. I hope that this has been profitable for you uh, this evening. Appreciate again so very much the opportunity to be with you. Uh, uh, look forward to other opportunities uh, to visit with you as, as meetings and stuff come along. But, but let me challenge you to think on these things, to think about your purpose, 
of life and serving God. Think about what purpose he has given us for being his servant. Try to make that meet and mesh together, whereas when we leave the church building, where we leave our homes, where we leave our office or whatever it is that we do, whether we're going to work or whether we're going to play or we're going to the job or we're going to the lake, take every advantage of living your life in such a way that just screams to those who see you and those who run into you that I'm very, very appreciative of the blood of Jesus Christ in my life. And if you have the opportunity, ask if they would be appreciative of that. If you are not a Christian, we encourage you to come and to obey the gospel this very evening. Uh, Hearing the Word of God, because faith comes from hearing the Word of God, believing that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and that He died on the cross for your sins, being willing to turn away from your sins and repentance. Jesus said, except you repent. That's no hope for your parents. Be willing to confess the good name of Jesus Christ before these good people. For whosoever confessed men, me before men, him will I confess before my Father is in heaven. And understand, that confession is a, is a lifetime confession. It's, a, it's, a, it's an everyday thing that we do in the way that we live our lives. Be baptized. Be immersed in, in, in water. Uh, be baptized so that your sins may be washed away by the blood of the Lamb of God that was given on the cross of Calvary to stand for you and to stand for your sin, to take your sin away so that you can receive the righteousness of God. And so when God looks at you, He doesn't see you as being of the world. He sees you in the world, but He doesn't see you being of the world. He sees you being of Christ way in his salvation. If you're a Christian, if you straight away, if you see things in your life that, 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 uh, that need to be uh, uh, repented of, uh, uh, confess those things. If, if it's a private nature, it's a public nature, and you need to come forward to ask for the prayers of the congregation in any matter. If we can help you in any way, let's do so while together we stand and while we sing. Let us say some. Would you bow, please? Our Heavenly Father, we're thankful for this opportunity that we can be 
uh, around this table. And Father, we're thankful for this loaf and which represents thy son's body that hung upon that cross. Be with these that partake. Bless them. Bless their uh, abilities to uh, be able to partake of this loaf. May it be pleasing unto thee. In Christ's name we pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this fruit of the vine that to us as Christians symbolizes your son's blood that was shed on the cross for the remission of our sins. As we take this now, let us do so in a manner that's pleasing to you. In your son's name we pray. Amen. If you would make sure you got your attendance cards filled out and be passing them towards the center aisle. I don't see Chisholm's. When I'm done with the announcements, we'll get uh, Carter Wilson and Walker Gray to take up the cards when I'm done. Uh, Go group tonight, Scott Corsi, meeting at Steve and Beverly Gipcombe's house. No need to bring anything. If you do need the directions, of course you can meet with Mr. Steve, Miss Beverly, or you can ask uh, Scott on how to get there. And they're having a sip and see on October 19th at 10 o'clock in the fellowship hall for Drew and Tiffany Gammons. If you have any questions about that, if you could see Miss Pam Barber on that. Is there anything else that needs to be announced at this time? All right, boys, pick up the cards. If you would be standing, we'll sing uh, Jesus Let Us Come to Know You as our closing song. Jesus, let us come to know you. Let us see Father, thank you so much for this Lord's Day and allowing us to come and worship you and sing praises to you. Lord, we thank you so much for bringing us together as a family and letting us worship you freely. If you would allow us to open our hearts and take you with us everywhere we go and be with us through the rest of the week. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <laughs>